my name is Ann Kent. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and the owner of Peas and Toppiness. I am not in my kitchen today, but I am sharing a couple of cooking tips. And if you like to grill meat or cook roasts or have trouble figuring out how to make fish that's uh, nice and tender and juicy but still cooked, uh, then this is the video for you. Because I'm gonna share my why behind why I always use a food thermometer when I prepare meat and even sometimes mix dishes, um, not just for food safety but also for quality. So um, when um, I first met my husband and we started cooking together, I found right away that we had slightly different views on what properly cooked meat was. Uh, he really does not like dry, overcooked meat. Clearly, that's there's a good reason for that. Uh, but I had been through all of this food safety training as a dietitian and understood the importance of cooking meat to the proper temperatures to avoid different foodborne illnesses. And so oftentimes we would make pork chops, cut them open, and they were a little bit pink inside. I'd be really nervous and he thought they were perfect. So we actually um, fixed our dispute <laughs> with um, what was the perfect temperature of cooked meat by using a food thermometer. And this is something that I learned in uh, my food safety training as I was going to school to become a dietitian. And then it's really been reinforced to me as I've become my own home cook and tried to figure out how to cook perfectly, perfectly um, texture and quality meat. So um, the reason for using a food thermometer is not just the food safety, but it's also going to give you the best food quality. And I actually have a download that you can uh, grab if that would be helpful. Um, I have this actually printed out and posted inside one of my cabinets because we refer to this all the time, whether we're grilling or baking something in the oven. It's super helpful. Uh, the other thing you'll see me talk about a lot is my favorite food thermometer. And so I'll drop a link for that as well. But if you would like to invest in a food thermometer, I highly Highly, highly recommend it. I recommend a food thermometer that has a probe that you can put in the meat inside where you're cooking, whether it's the grill or the oven, and then has a probe or a cord that's attached to a digital thermometer. So if you don't want to use mine, go to your local um, kitchen store, find one that meets, meets those requirements, and you'll be good to go. Um, so let's just go briefly through a couple of the different types of meat and talk about their different um, temperatures. Um, so there's a little bit of why behind this as well. So some foods are more prone to different foodborne illnesses, and so it, they require a little bit higher cooking temperature. So things like um, poultry, for example, whether it's uh, chicken, turkey, um, duck, if, um, if you hunt wild game, any of those poultry, those you'll want to cook to an internal temperature of 165. Um, ideally, it, it needs to be at that temperature for about 15 seconds and that will kill all harmful bacteria. Now this is also a great temperature for quality. It's not going to leave your chicken dry. It's going to continue to be nice and moist. I found that if once you get to about 180, then that's when it starts to become a little bit more dry. So sticking up at 165 will ensure perfectly safe meat, but also it'll be great quality. So another really um, high temperature meat that we cook is ground meat. Uh, so this could be beef, um, it could be a sausage, pork, um, the only exception to this is poultry. Poultry, anytime you have poultry, whatever form it's in, whether ground or whole, you always want to cook it to 165. But otherwise, ground meat should be cooked to 160 um, degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because um, even though beef may be um, safe in steak form to just cook it to a, a, a lower temperature, when it's been mixed, all of those pieces of meat have been exposed to the different areas of the food processing. So if there was any bacteria on the outside of the meat, now it can be transferred to the inside. So we wanna cook it to a higher temperature to make sure that it is not overdone. So if you're not terribly worried about this and if you're not in a high risk group for foodborne illness, um, meaning pregnancy, small children, the elderly, uh, compromised immune systems, then uh, you can adjust your, your hamburger to your liking, but perfectly um, cooked food safe meat would be to a temperature of 160. And that is gonna be well done. 
Um, ne next, moving on, since we are talking about beef, uh, if we're talking about the perfectly cooked steak, um, this is another area where it seems kind of silly, but going by temperature rather than time will ensure a really well done steak for you. So if you like a rare steak, which would be cool with a red center, that's only going to be about 125. And then about every uh, 10 degrees is how it goes up. Um, so medium rare is about 135. Medium is about 145. Uh, medium well is about 150. That's the only exception to that 10 degree rule. And then well done is 160. So um, using a food thermometer is going to ensure that you have a much more evenly cooked piece of meat than simply trying to time it because there can be so many different factors that go into how, how long it takes to cook it to a certain temperature, the thickness of the meat, whether the meat was at room temperature or refrigerated beforehand, the hotness of your grill or skillet. So make sure you use a food thermometer to get that to what you want. And then the other benefit of a food thermometer is that you don't have to cut inside it and you don't lose any of those juices. The only other note I want to say is with the steak, um, we talked about different temperatures of that. So technically the food safe version would be the same as the whole um, veal or, or um, whole beef, which is 145. So if you decide that you would like a rare steak, um, that does not totally protect you against foodborne illness, although it is delicious and I understand uh, why you would want to take that risk sometimes. The risk is pretty minimal for those large pieces of meat as long as you're getting them from a quality supplier. So moving on to some roast, this is really similar. Um, roast, whether it's whole beef, whole veal, whole lamb, um, and actually this is true also with pork. So a pork loin or a pork roast, all of these are gonna be cooked to 145. Now, a lot of times you will notice that if you cook this all the way to 145, there will still be pink in the middle, and that can be a little bit disconcerting at first, but again, um, rest assured that this is a food safe temperature uh, because we are cooking, especially the outside of the meat where most of the potential for foodborne illness could be. The inside is very low risk for foodborne illness because it has not been exposed to the outside. So. 145 is sufficient. You do not need to cook it until it's white in the middle of its pork, um, and this will that will um, give you a really nice, tender, juicy roast. The other pro tip about that is to pull this out a little bit early, a little bit before it reaches 145, maybe about 140, um, even 135, depending on um, how large the roast is, and then allow it to rest for about 10 minutes as it continues to come up to temperature. If you're having trouble getting it up to temperature, it might be because it's a smaller roast and it doesn't have as much residual heat so this what you would want to pull it out closer to like the 143 time um, or temperature on the roast so the larger the roast the more residual heat it has you can pull it out a little bit earlier and it'll continue to rise now if you have a a, a piece of meat that has different parts to it, like a, a whole turkey is a really good example. You will want to check in different parts of the bird or the roast to make sure that you're finding the lowest temperature. We're always cooking the lowest temperature up to that minimum temperature uh, to ensure that food safety. So the last uh, thing on our list, well, it's two things. Actually, we have fish. Fish is a little bit different because um, you, you can cook it to 145 as well, uh, but some fish is very hard to uh, temp. And so this is one of the foods that's actually recommended to go based on site. Uh, so you'll wanna cook your fish to a point where it is opaque. Uh, raw fish is a little, it's um, not, Clear exactly but as you cook it it becomes more solid in, in the color and so as it becomes fully cooked it'll become more opaque and you'll also be able to flake it with a fork you want to cook it just until it starts to flake if you overcook that fish it is going to become tough and it's not going to be as tasty so watch that carefully or again uh, if you have a solid piece of fish that um, a really nice fish fillet then you can um, measure the temperature and you want it to 145 the last thing on the list is something that we don't often talk about, but it's things like leftovers, casserole, egg dishes, and um, even pre-cooked meat. All of these carry an additional risk of foodborne illness because they've oftentimes passed through this temperature where bacteria like to live more than once. We call that the temperature danger zone. So if a food has been cooked and then cooled and then reheated, it's moved through that temperature where bacteria like several times. And so it's really important to get that up to 
a safe cooking temperature, and that is 165. So again, this could be pre-cooked ham, pre-cooked sausage, it could be um, leftovers that you cooked the day before. I see a lot of times um, we, uh, we have this feeling that leftovers are not as important to reheat properly because they've already been cooked, but if they have not been cooled properly, it can actually be more of a risk of foodborne illness than the food was the first time. So it's really important to always cook meat and other dishes up until their full temperature the first time, cool them properly within two to four hours, and then uh, reheat them to their proper temperature. So that's going to just ensure that you do not get foodborne illness at home, which Contrary to popular belief, the most common place that you're going to find foodborne illness is in your own kitchen. It's very unlikely to have a foodborne illness when you go out to eat because uh, the restaurants that you're going to have been inspected and they are following all of these guidelines. Their cooks have been trained most likely in this food safety that um, they know what these temperatures need to be. If this would be helpful for you, um, make sure to grab the download. I would love to share that with you. If you have any questions or if you have any feedback or any thoughts about what your perfectly cooked piece of meat is, feel free to drop a comment. Otherwise, thank you for joining me. I hope that this is a helpful guide for you and I look forward to catching you next week. Take care, everybody.